A couple of years ago, a humor columnist for a local newspaper wrote on a serious and thought-provoking subject. I quote from this article, being a go-to church Mormon living in Utah means living so close to fellow ward members that not much happens that the entire congregation doesn't know in about five minutes tops. He continues, this kind of cheek-to-jowl living can be intrusive. It also happens to be one of our greatest strengths. The author goes on to say, at work Tuesday, I caught the noon broadcast on television. A van had been obliterated in a traffic accident. A young mother and two small children were being rushed to the emergency rooms by helicopter and ambulance. Hours later, I learned that the van belonged to the young couple living across the street from me in Harriman, Eric and Gina Quigley. Not only do I see the Quigleys in church, we ate dinner with them at a neighborhood party the night before the crash. Our grandkids played with daughters Bianca and Miranda. Fourteen-month-old Miranda suffered serious head injuries and died three days later at Primary Children's Hospital. Here's where all that noisiness pays off. Although the accident occurred several miles from home, the dust literally had not settled before someone from the ward stopped and was pulling through the wreckage. The rest of the ward knew about it before the cops and the paramedics showed up. Ward members went to all three hospitals, contacted Eric at work, and organized into labor squads. People who didn't get in on the immediate need level were frantic for some way to help. In 48 hours, the Quigley yard was mowed, home cleaned, laundry done, refrigerator stocked, relatives fed, and a trust was set up in the local bank. We would have given their dog a bath if they had one. The author concludes with this insightful comment. There is a positive side to the congregational microscope my ward lives under. What happens to a few happens to all. The compassion and service rendered by caring ward members as a result of this tragic accident are not unique to this particular incident. The Book of Mormon Alma explains to prospective followers of Christ as ye are desirous to come unto the fold of God and be called his people, and are willing to bear one another's burdens that they may be light, yea, and are willing to mourn with those that mourn, and yea, comfort those that stand need of comfort, then, as Alma explained, then, then they were prepared for baptism. This scripture lays the foundation for ministering and caring in a most compassionate way. The ward is organized to minister to the needs of those who face even the most difficult and heartbreaking trials. The bishop, often considered the father of the ward, is there to provide counsel and resources, but also close at hand are Melchizedek and Aaronic priesthood leaders, the Relief Society presidency, home teachers, visiting teachers, and the ward members. Always the ward members. All are there to minister comfort and show compassion in times of need. In my own immediate neighborhood, we have had our share of heart-wrenching tragedies. In October 1998, 19-year-old Zach Newton, who lived only three houses east from us, was killed in a tragic automobile accident. Less than two years later, in July, 19-year-old Andrea Richards, who lived directly across from the Newtons, was killed in an automobile accident. One Saturday afternoon in July 2006, Travis Bastian, a 28-year-old returned missionary, and his 15-year-old sister Desiree, who lived across the street and two houses north of us, were killed in a terrible automobile accident. One month later, in August 2006, 32-year-old Eric Gold, who grew up in the whole house next door to us, suffered a premature death, and others in this neighborhood have suffered also heart-wrenching experiences, privately endured and known only to themselves and God. With the loss of five young people, one might assume that this is an unusual number of trials for one small neighborhood. I choose to think the number only seems large because of a close, caring ward whose members know when there is a pressing need. It is a ward with members who are following the admonition of Alma and the Savior members who care and love and bear one another's burdens, members willing to mourn with those that mourn, members willing to comfort in those in need of comfort, 
members who endure together. In each of these instances, we saw an outpouring of love, service, and compassion that was inspirational to all. Bishops arrived, home and visiting teachers went into action, and Melchizedek and Aaronic priesthood quorums and relief societies organized to take care of both spiritual and temporal needs. Refrigerators were stocked, houses cleaned, lawns mowed, shrubs trimmed, fences painted, blessings given, and soft shoulders were available for crying on. Members were everywhere. In every one of these instances, the family who lost a loved one expressed increased faith, increased love for the Savior, increased gratitude for the Atonement, and heartfelt thankfulness for an organization that responds to the deepest emotional and spiritual needs of its members. These families now speak how they got to know the Lord through their adversity. They relate many sweet experiences that grew out of their pain. They testify that blessings can emerge from heartbreak. They give praise to the Lord and would echo the words of Job, The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From bearing one another's burdens as ward members, we have learned several lessons. One, the Lord's organization is fully adequate to know and care for those with even the most dire emotional and spiritual needs. Two, adversity can bring us closer to God with a renewed and enlightened appreciation for prayer and the Atonement, which covers pain and suffering in all other manifestations. Three, members who suffer tragedy firsthand often experience an increased past capacity for love, compassion, and understanding. They become the first, last, and often the most effective responders in giving comfort and showing compassion to others. Four, a ward as well as a family draws closer together as they endure together. What happens to one happens to all. And perhaps five most important, we can each be more compassionate and caring because we have each had our own personal trials and experiences to draw from. We can endure together. I rejoice in belonging to such a loving and caring organization. No one knows better how to bear one another's burdens, mourn with those that mourn, and comfort those who stand in need and comfort. I choose to call it enduring together. What happens to one happens to all. We endure together. May we be in an instrument in lightening the burden of others, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.